Okay, hey everybody, this is your buddy Carl for the Daily Bible Reading. And it is, <clears throat> excuse me, April the 10th, 2020, and it is Good Friday. So I bless you all with a happy and blessed Good Friday, even in the middle of all the worldwide stuff going on. Gotta, gotta really not just keep a positive attitude, but let your spirit be focused on the big picture of life and things of the spirit, which a lot of times when a crisis happens, this becomes the pull, which I think that's how the Lord uses difficulties to draw people to him. Not that I, and I don't believe God causes it. I'm just saying he uses it because in the broken world, we're in the, the, you know, the world is broken, downfall of Adam and Eve, all that, you know, the corruption of the earth and of mankind and the enemy doing his business. What we celebrate today is the fact that 2,000 years ago, Jesus conquered it. He died on the cross, became the ultimate perfect lamb of God, offering himself as the spotless lamb in, in all ways, in all realms. Not only did he heal us spiritually, but it encompasses our being so that we'll, you know, able to do well in the earth. I believe there is a place where uh, even the apostle said, I pray that your lives prosper or that your soul prospers the same way your spirit has prospered or your spirit is prospering in Christ. And that's available to every believer. And God calls out to all of the earth, all of mankind to come and participate the powerful thing of the free gift of salvation is the fact that religion, mankind religion, or works-based religion will not earn favor with God. And we see that as we get into the daily Bible reading. All the Old Testament law and regulations, the people could not keep it. They couldn't fulfill it. And so, anyway, here we are on Good Friday, celebrating the fact that Jesus, when he died, was sacrificed the sinless man, the sinless God that he was, perfect sacrifice, it destroyed the division between God and man, the thing that we've always been wanting. So it's the fulfillment of God's purposes for mankind to become, you know, redeemed in him and have a way to the Father. That's powerful. And really, all the shadows of prophecies of Old Testament, all the writings and the laws and everything being kind of shadows and types, we call those shadows and types, it points to the need that God would do something to redeem the fall of man, which is in Christ. So anyway, happy, happy Good Friday. We celebrate that, which will, obviously, Jesus' death is the sacrifice, his blood poured out, is the perfect blood redeeming us on Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. He conquers sin and death by conquering death. He rises from the tomb. God raised him up on the third day. The firstborn of the resurrection, really. Even though people have been raised from the dead through history, right? <clears throat> Lazarus, Jesus raised Lazarus. But... The ultimate victory for all of us to one day rise from the dead and be with the Father. Our spirits never die, but our we will get a heavenly body. So that's the mini ser sermon of encouragement for Good Friday, people. There you go. So it is April 10th, 2020. It's a Friday. Most people are locked in. A lot of Passion Week celebrations will all be done by streaming, which please join us or plug into your church or whatever stream encourages your faith in this day. Use the weekend to retool the way you think about your faith. And if you've never believed on Jesus and believed what he done has done, I encourage you to open your heart to that. Are, is there overwhelming evidence of the truth of it? Sure. I mean, more and more as time passes, there's there's proof, but it's still a leap of faith. You still have to acknowledge it and believe it. And there's never going to be enough proof for the doubters. They just say, no, it's a story. It's not a story. It's historically so strong. So I encourage you to stay engaged with that. 
and to pull on that. So anyway, be blessed today. Let's pick it up here, April the 10th, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 32, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 34, into the book of Joshua. So 34, here you go, Deuteronomy, Moses is going to die here. It's his time to go. And the Lord says, you know, come, it's time. He's going to go up this mountain and there he'll die. Chapter 34, Deuteronomy. Then Moses went up to Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab and climbed Pisgah Peak, which is across from Jericho. And the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead as far as Dan, all the land of Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, extending to the Mediterranean Sea, the Negev, the Jordan Valley with Jericho, the city of Palms as far as Zoar, or Zor. Then the Lord said to Moses, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When I said, I will give it to your descendants, I have not allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you will not enter the land. Sorry, I, God says, I have now allowed you to see it with your own eyes, but you will not enter. <clears throat> and that's because of Moses' rebellion which I, I personally thought, Lord, was it really that bad? But there was something deeper going on, and the Lord knew it. So we're moving on in the reading. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, just as the Lord had said. The Lord buried him in a valley near Beth Peor in Moab. But to this day, no one knows the exact place. Hold on, people. Big five-star statement. So God called him up there to die. And it says, the Lord buried him. Ah, how do we know that? Well, all we can do is trust Holy Spirit spoke to the writers that this is what was going to happen with Moses because of his position in the Lord. So we go with it. So the Lord buried him in the valley near Beth Peor in Moab, but to this day they don't know the exact place. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyesight was clear and he was strong as ever. Take note here. People say, well, you get old and you get feeble. No, that's not part of, that's part of the curse of the downfall of man, but we do not have to be sickly and become weak. Moses is 120 years old and in Christ with the redemption of our lives, I'm believing we can die when it's our time. In other words, when God says our book is fulfilled, he's written a scroll or a book of our life. I believe the, full, the perfect fulfillment of his promise is the fact, like Moses, is that we do not have to die like that. We just, it's time, we close our eyes, and we know the Lord said it's time to go home. I prefer that, don't you? I'm believing for that. So there you go. Moses was 120, and he was as strong as ever. The people of Israel mourned for Moses on the plains of Moab for 30 days until the customary period of mourning was over. How about that? They gave people 30 days to mourn the loss of someone great like that. <clears throat> there has never been a, another prophet in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Another unique characteristic <clears throat> that I've prayed for, like, Lord, that's awesome. He spoke to God like a friend face to face. I would love that. The Lord sent him to perform all the miraculous signs and wonders in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land. With mighty power, Moses performed terrifying acts in the sight of all Israel. Awesome sights. Terrifying, yeah, if you weren't under the Lord. So there you go. That's the end of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, and that's the end of the book. And now that's the end of the Pentateuch, right? The Torah, the original Old Testament law for our Jewish friends. Now we move into the other books, the next stage of books. And for today's reading, we're going to get through Joshua all the way up to chapter 2, verse 24. Okay, so here we go, and I won't unpack as much there. Joshua was the one <clears throat> faithful to the Lord and was assigned the task to bring the people into the promised land. After the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, 
the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, Moses, my servant is dead. Therefore, the time has come for you to lead these people, the Israelites, across the Jordan River into the land I'm giving them. I promise you what I promised Moses. Wherever you set your foot, you will be on land I have on the land I have given you, from the Negev wilderness in the south to the Lebanon mountains in the north, from the Euphrates River in the east to the Mediterranean Sea in the west, including all the land of the Hittites. So folks, when you think of Israel's boundaries now, it's smaller, but that's what the Lord had originally intended as the land for the Israelites. How about that? There you go. Biblical. If you believe the biblical timeline and the maps and what God had given his people, that's their land. Okay, there you go. Not going to talk other stuff. Here we go. Verse 5. No one will be able to stand against you as long as you live, for I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. Be strong and courageous, for you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Second time, be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. This is my command, third time. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So, folks, pause. In scripture writing, many times a repetition of a command or an encouragement three times is a divine stamp. In other words, three times God's saying it. It's He is adamant about the follow through and what you're being given in that moment. So I won't unpack more, you know, scholarly ideas, but three times when you hear something being repeated a lot, it's not because we're forgetting. There's a emphasis in the spirit for us. Moving on. Uh, Joshua then commanded the officers of Israel, go through the camp and tell the people to get their provisions ready. In three days you will cross the Jordan River and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. Then Joshua called together the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. He told them, remember what Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you? The Lord your God is giving you a place of rest. He has given you this land. Your wives, children, and livestock may remain here in the land. Moses assigned you on the east side of the Jordan River, <clears throat> but your strong warriors, fully armed, must lead the other tribes across the Jordan to help them conquer their territory. Stay with them until the Lord gives them rest as he has given you rest. And until they too possess the land the Lord your God is giving them, only then may you return and settle here on the east side of the Jordan River in the land that Moses, the servant of the Lord, assigned to you. They answered Joshua to Joshua, we will do whatever you command us and we will go wherever you send us. We will obey you just as we obeyed Moses. And may the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. Anyone who rebels against your orders and does not obey your words and everything you command will be put to death. Get this, be strong and courageous. Fourth time, now they, the tribe leaders are confirming the Lord's word. Fourth time. How about that? That's awesome. Chapter 2 of Joshua. Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side, right? On the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. That night. How about that? How strange is that? Side note, do you realize this is one of Jesus' descendants, the prostitute Rahab? <laughs> what? Isn't that funny? Jesus' lineage has all these flawed human beings. Of course, he was in the line of mankind, 
right? Sure, he was fully God and fully man. And I think it's unique, the fact that all these people with flaws are just a representation of mankind. So no big deal, but it's interesting, you know, God didn't look for like the perfected people by which to bring Jesus' bloodline from the human line. Isn't that interesting? Okay, moving on. Wow. But someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the whole land. Rahab had hidden the two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. Hmm. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you can probably catch up with them. And actually, she had taken them up to the roof and hidden them beneath bundles of flax she had laid out. So the king's men went looking for the spies along the road leading to the shallow crossings of the Jordan River. And as soon as the king's men had left, the gate of Jericho was shut. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with him. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know that what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things, for the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above the earth below. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will be kind to me and my family since I have helped you. Give me some guarantee that when Jericho is conquered, you will let me live along with my father and mother, my brothers and sisters and all their families. So she was bidding for her whole lineage. How about that? We offer our own, our own lives as a guarantee for your safety, the men agreed. If you don't betray us, we will keep our promise and be kind to you when the Lord gives us the land. Then since Rahab's house was built into the town wall, she let them down by a rope through the window. Escape to the hill country, she told them. Hide there for three days from the men searching for you. Then when they have returned, you can go on your way. Before they left, the men told her, We will be bound by the oath we have taken only if you follow these instructions. When we come into the land, you must leave this scarlet rope hanging from the window through which you let us down. And all your family members, your father, mother, brothers, and all your relatives must be here inside the house. If they go out into the street and are killed, it will not be our fault. But if anyone lays a hand on people inside the house, we will accept the responsibility for their death. If you betray us, however, we are not bound by this oath in any way. So these spies from Israel, they're not sure about this prostitute, right? They're like, okay, we're going to make a deal with you, and this is how it's going to go. And it isn't an interesting, the scarlet rope in the window, a Passover sign. You get that? Red rope. Oh, that shows that the people inside are protected. I just, I get that imagery even with this. How about that? Verse 21, I accept your terms, she replied, and she sent them on their way, leaving the scarlet rope hanging from the window. The spies went up into the hill country and stayed there three days. The men who were chasing them searched everywhere along the road, but they finally returned without success. Then the two spies came down from the hill country, crossed the Jordan River, and reported to Joshua all that had happened to them. The Lord has given us the whole land, they said, for all the people in the land are terrified of us. Well, sure they are. They've heard the story of the Israelites and how God has spared them through so much. Okay, that's April 10th, the Old Testament reading up through chapter 2. And today's psalm on Good Friday, this April 10th, is Psalm... 79, 1 through 13. This is also a psalm of Asaph, a head singer or minstrel of the temple. 
our tabernacle. The theme of this is when outraged by injustice, cry out to God, not against him. In times of disaster, our mood may be anger, but our trust must remain in God. Yes, Lord, teach us how to trust. The author Asaph, or one of his descendants, could have written this, probably written after the Babylonians had leveled Jerusalem. That's, a, that's coming up later. Okay, here we go. Chapter 79 of Psalms. O God, pagan nations have conquered your land, your special possession. They have defiled your holy temple and made Jerusalem a heap of ruins. They have left the bodies of your servants as food for the birds of heaven. The flesh of your godly ones has become food for the wild animals. Blood has flowed like water all around Jerusalem. No one is left to bury the dead. We are mocked by our neighbors, an object of scorn and derision to those around us. O oh Lord, how long will you be angry with us forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? Pour out your wrath on the nations that refuse to acknowledge you, on kingdoms that don't call upon your name, for they have devoured your people, Israel, making the land a desolate wilderness. Do not hold us guilty for the sins of our ancestors. Let your compassion quickly meet ours, meet our needs. This is a very significant thing. And you can see in that time they're dealing with the consequences of their rebellion, their sin, and everything, right? <clears throat> God is pay, making them pay right now for their sins because the sacrifices aren't being activated. If they've fallen away from the religion, they're not even paying for their sins. The, the priests aren't offering up sacrifices for their sins. So imagine now in Old Testament time, now there's full consequences for all that. Jesus dying for us and his blood being poured out, we are constantly in a state of the covering of the blood. And uh, I won't go in to all the details, but people say, well, what if we don't, what if we sin and we don't confess it? Well, what if we sin and confess it? Well, we all mess up, we sin. And we acknowledge it before the Lord, confess it to the Lord. But the, the paradox of this is we are still under the blood. And I won't get into the theological debate of that, but people say, how can that be? Because if we acknowledge Jesus as our Redeemer and we really love him, we live to obey him and want to live rightly for him because it's written in our books to do so. But these people didn't have that. So I'm not going to preach that sermon, but that you have to realize, again, always remember Old Testament is a shadow of the fulfillment of all this in Christ. Super important to understand that as believers. We can't, and I'm saying that only because it is Passion Week, Holy Week, and even many in the church feel like, oh, we, can, we can't be sure of heaven. We can't know. That's not really true. Uh, Romans, if you read the whole council of New Covenant theology, not just bits and pieces, you know, but the whole council proclaims the redemption of Christ for those who are in Christ Jesus, Right? There is no, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And people could say, well, what does that mean? Being in Christ means you love him and you really believe and you want to live for him. So that when you mess up, you turn from that, you repent. But you're living under the blood, you're living under grace. And then other scriptures that say, and God doesn't remember, he separates your sins as far as the east is from the west. What? How can we be separated from our sin? Because our spirit, God is inhabiting us as spiritual temples. It, it's, it's amazing what the Lord did. It's, it's the miracle of Calvary. Get that? It's a, it's a miracle. It's God's purposed plan for the victory of Christ Jesus. And that's what we celebrate today. And especially Sunday when he rises to to seal it, conquering sin and death. And that's what we abide in when we abide in Christ. It doesn't come and go. We live in it. Doesn't mean our flesh and our lives on this side is, are perfected, our souls and our bodies, we, we're dealing with things, but our spirits are fully redeemed. 
And in that, as long as we, we acknowledge it's not in ourselves, we're not saving ourselves. Jesus is our salvation. Anyway, there you go. So help us, help us, O God, of our salvation. Verse 9, help us for the glory of your name. Save us and forgive our sins for the honor of your name. And he has in Christ. Why should pagan nations be allowed to scoff, asking, where is their God? Show us your vengeance against the nations, for they have spilled the blood of your servants. Listen to the moaning of the prisoners. Demonstrate your great power by saving those condemned to die. O Lord, pay back our neighbors seven times for the scorn they have hurled at you. Then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will thank you for ever and ever, praising your greatness from generation to generation. Yes, Lord, help us to do that. Again, reminding you, those of you that hear me a lot, realize when we read the psalmist or the Old Testament writers pouring out their hearts and their passions to the Lord, remember in Christ, we do not pray for the destruction of our enemies. We don't. We pray for God's intervention, for God to come and save and to help if we have enemies But a believer's stance is like, mercy, Lord, praying out for a breakthrough of your light into the lost souls of mankind, even our own personal enemies. Just don't curse them. Let God manage his business. Pray for a breakthrough. Pray for mercy. And sure, that so that one, we don't, I don't want payback to my neighbors seven times for their evil, right? No, 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 no. Lord, bring a breakthrough and we'll release it to the Lord. We do not pray for that. Plus, now it wouldn't be accomplished that way anyway. Verse 13 is where we live. We, your people, the sheep of your pasture, thank you forever and ever, Lord, for your protection and covering, praising your greatness from generation to generation. That's where we abide, right? That's Psalm 79. All right, April 10th. Today's proverb is Proverbs 12, 26. The godly give good advice to their friends. The wicked lead them astray. Well, sure they do. The godly should be offering good advice and encouragement to everyone, especially their friends. And wicked people aren't about anything that's good, but it's good to remember that, okay? May we be ones living for the Lord to offer help where we can. All right, and here we go. Today's reading, Luke 13, 22 through 14, 6. So Luke, we're going to pick it up right here at Luke 22. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing on toward Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He replied, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter but will fail. Hmm. When the master of the house has locked the door, it will be too late. You will stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us, but he will reply, I don't know you and where you come from. Then you will say, but we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. And he will reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you came from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. It's pause here, ponder this. This is the the intensity, the narrow way. People say, oh, you know, it's easy. It's not easy to get into heaven. It is Jesus. There's not many spokes of the wheel heading into the hub of God. No, the scriptures don't play that out. Even as a man, as a human being, it's like, oh Lord, I get it. I feel the Lord's made it difficult. And if I was preaching my own gospel, I might say, yeah, if you just try to be good and you're just, you know, God just loves everybody. He's letting everybody in. That's wrong. And I can't live in, I have to trust God's own words. So I'm not passing judgment. Even Jesus said the truth is its judgment. The gospel itself, the good news is its own judgment. And he's talking about people here like, well, I knew about Jesus. I heard all this stuff. But you never entered in. You never made him the way. It became something where like, well, you know, the Jesus thing, I'll get to that later. Man, friends, don't wait. If you're still pondering this, It doesn't make us evil to hold up the banner of truth of who Jesus Christ is. We love God with all our hearts and we love people with all that we are. And we pray and we work to show the way 
to the narrow gate into the kingdom. Thank you, Lord. Moving on, verse 28, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for you will see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, remember the fathers of the faith here, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you will be thrown out and people will come from all over the world, from east and west, north and south, to take their places in the kingdom of God. And note this, some who seem least important now will be the greatest then, and some who are the greatest now will be the least important. Ah, wow, that's sobering. I think about that like, Lord, we don't know what our status is. So I think the Lord is saying, stay humble. Don't try to position yourself as something great. The Lord says to judge yourself soberly, and we do. Like, Lord, it's we have no idea how God sees people of faith and where they fit in that. I'll move on. At that time, some Pharisees said to him, get away from here if you want to live. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Jesus replied, go tell that fox, I will keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow and the third day. I will accomplish my purpose. Yes, today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must proceed on my way, for it wouldn't do for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. Whoa, Jesus is predicting his coming death, which we're you know, we're honoring and celebrating that today, but he sees it coming. He knows it's time to fulfill it. Verse 34, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often have I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now look at your house. You're, it's abandoned. And you will never see me again until you say, Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That is Jesus. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is Jesus and Jerusalem and all of the earth, earth have to proclaim honor and blessing and praise to the one, Jesus. That's who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 14. And today we're going to finish up from uh, chapter 14, 1 through 6. One Sabbath day, Jesus went to eat dinner in the home of a leader of the Pharisees, and the people were watching him closely. There was a man there whose arms and legs were swollen. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in religious law, Is it permitted in the law to heal people on the Sabbath day or not? When they refused to answer, Jesus touched the sick man and healed him and sent him away. Then he turned to them and said, Which of you doesn't work on the Sabbath? If your son or your cow falls into a pit, don't you rush out to get him out? Again, they could not answer. And there you go. Jesus, again, is violating the letter of the law of the Sabbath and the law in general, but the intent of it. And we always have to remember that. So that's the reading for today. God bless you all. Have a very blessed April 10th and good Friday. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.